So, this is a book review thread for Masters of Doom by David Kushner. And uh, this book was gifted to me by Jijo Sunny. And I'm very grateful for it because it's a, it's a really good book and I enjoyed it a lot. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed it more than a lot of books that I've read in recent times. Uh, particularly because I think this book um, says so much about the things that I have been familiar with but didn't know the specifics of. So when I was a kid, uh, my siblings, my sister and my brother, they would play Wolf 3D, Wolfenstein, and you know they were pretty good at it i don't think i ever completed the game myself but i witnessed them playing it and you know kind of struggling through it and completing it and i remember thinking wow that's so cool right and then i also played uh, i'm familiar with doom the first original game and uh i i don't think i played it either i played i played duke nukem 3d which was made by 3D Realms. It wasn't made by it. So this is a book about it software, which was, you know, John Romero and John Carmack and their friends and, you know, colleagues. What else? Uh, I played Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal fairly, fairly recently. I don't think either Romero or Carmack are involved with it software anymore. But, you know, they, they, they started the whole genre you could say right they were the ones who kind of kind of invented first person shooting games action games and this book is a really lovingly put together biography a history of of these things that were a part of my life you know i've i've cared a lot about gaming i've cared about computers and and software and um just making stuff to share with other people and so this really goes into the details of what it was like for these guys to to come up with something right and and i guess i'll just i'll just talk about what i enjoyed um you know it's just the the, the process of making stuff i remember when i was done with the book i i wrote some tweets about it and i think i said things like it's so inspiring that a group of people, you know, just even a couple of guys, right, can come together bonded by their love of some technology. And I'm sure the story is the same for people who have, you know, created scenes in the past where they came up with a new style of music or they came up with... Um, what else can you do? You can, you know, science, right? Art, painting, literature, right? There, there are people who come together... They are interested in something. They make the thing happen. They make things. They share the things with each other. And they, they find that there's a whole scene of people who are also interested in the thing. They share it with each other. It gets it becomes something much greater than themselves. And it spreads. And, you know, they can make money from it. They can sell it. They can There's, there's, there's events that they, they make. And people show up to these events. Right? There's this whole community. People become friends. I'm sure there's been at least one doom themed wedding or you know like a action rpg f fighting game rpg shooting game rpg whatever uh i was struck by how you know in the early days for them it was such a like when you f before doom was a thing before video games were the massive multi-billion dollar industry that it is today it was just something that a bunch of hobbyists came together and made and played with and, you know, I'm sure this is also true for, like, early YouTube, right? So now it's 2020 and there are loads of people who make a living on YouTube. And, uh, you know, there's a whole industry around it. There's controversies. There's all sorts of stuff. But in the earliest days, it was really just people making videos because they wanted to share it with other people. And they wanted to connect with people about their topic of interest, whether it's makeup, whether it's you know, philosophy, whatever it is that you care about. And I was very inspired to to just to read through that process. You know, one of at the back of the book I I listed page sixty shareware. And uh, on page sixty the David writes about how 
how shareware was was a way for was a business model, right? So what what happens is with shareware is that you give away a bit of your game for free, like the first couple of chapters, and then if people like the game, they can choose to to buy the game. I mean, the very the 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 specifics are not that important. I mean, it's very interesting if you really want to get into it, and I recommend reading the book to get into it. But like just this idea of I'm gonna make something, I'm gonna give it away for free, or give some of it away for free. That I I found that that renewed my inspiration. It renewed, it renewed my conviction, my belief that I could do the same thing. I there's there's nothing to stop anybody else from doing what John Romero and Carmack have done, which is to make something you love, share it with people for free, and then you, you know, you build an audience. You build you you find a group of people who care about what you care about, and then you and then you have new opportunities that that emerge. Right, yeah, there's new things that you can do. And you know, early on, when they start making these games, people email them, reach out to them, saying, "Hey, you, you know, uh, can I be a play tester? Right? Can I can I help you out with this? Can I build stuff for it?" And then, you know, when when the internet kind of became a thing, they before it, it before there was like um, more complex ways of playing online. It used to have to go through um, local networks, LAN, right? And so people would pay to you no know, people would ask to host LAN I don't know the specifics but people would volunteer and I mean or they would get paid for it and then they would charge other people for it and there's this whole ecosystem that emerges where people who want to play the game pay the guys who are running their local servers I think I don't know the specifics of how it works out I forgot I've forgotten that already but I remember feeling the excitement I think that's the real gift that this book has given me which is a reminder of the most fundamental basics which is work really hard on making things that you really like that you really really like that you think are really great share them with other people who you think will also appreciate it if you did a really really good job they will then want to share it with other people right and then that spreads and now you have you have a movement you have a, a a scene right and once you have that scene like new and interesting and magical things can happen and there's also kind of a cautionary tale in this or you know kind of a and it's, it's, which is that you know so like Romero and Carmack are different people who have different personalities different and they have the shared interest in programming in games but uh, Romero is more of a I think Carmack describes Romero as an empire builder while Romero describes Carmack or Carmack describes himself as a technologist so Carmack was the guy who built the game engines the game engines are kind of the 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 underlying technical system upon which the game is built you know so like uh you need to upgrade your game engine so that you can have dynamic lighting which makes the game feel more exciting because the lights are changing stuff like that and so Carmack was continually pushing the envelope on what game engines could do Romero was like the creative all-rounded guy who would you know say let's add more blood and violence to the game right and then you know they got popular enough that when the Columbine tragedy happened, the shootings, uh, people were looking for something to blame, and some some of the blame went to video games, and then there was that whole thing. There was, there's there's details about how you know they were working, they were each working their day jobs, I guess, and then they were trying to do this thing on the side, and how they managed that, and then you know when the thing gets bigger and popular, they start they start making promises to people and they have created disagreements about, you know, who does what. I'm going to be referenced... So I'm writing a novel about a bunch of kids in Singapore's music scene in the early 2000s. And I'm going to be referencing this book several times, I think, to get into the details of what it's like to have creative differences. Because early on when you're small, creative differences are are good. You know, you challenge each other, you push each other to be better. And you know you each kind of fill each other's gaps, and 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 your respective strong points kind of come together. But then you know when you when you succeed, success is a kind of curse. Like okay, you make a bunch of money, yeah, but now like you're bigger, you have you have more of a following, you have expectations on you, and you have differences of opinion in how to manage things, how to talk to the public, how to describe what it is that you've done. You know, it's it's open to interpretation and you'll interpret things differently. And I'm sure you'll see the same thing play out in when you study how like 
bands become successful and then fall apart, right? Like what? Why did the Beatles, you know, with the whole uh, Lennon McCartney relationship, the creative dynamic? I'm not really going into too much of the specifics, but it felt good to to read this to feel like somebody was walking me through the specifics of the games that I loved and the, the spirit that I loved. I think I think the spirit of shareware is something that I'm very moved by this idea of giving stuff away for free and that it will pay off subsequently right i mean and i'm not i'm not completely naive i know that you know you can't just keep making stuff for free and giving it all away like you have to charge for something i i have an ebook you can buy my ebook if you want but you don't have to i, I don't expect you to right it's just it's just this this kind of gift semi gift economy that I think is very nourishing and and it's an alternative to the hyper utilitarian capitalist mindset where everything has a price you know if you want something you have to pay for it you know like no you can't look don't don't look and don't touch if you're not gonna buy it like i I've never liked that frame, and maybe there are contexts in which that becomes necessary. But I want to believe that It's still possible in the world For people to just make stuff Share stuff And be rewarded for it appropriately And I think you know Like in the case of Doom Like uh, They made enough money to buy sports cars Right And uh, there's this part about Romero saying This is the Ferrari that Doom bought Which is cool I think that's really You know Even Like there's this sense that If If some Kind of Uh you know, some guy in typing away at his computer makes enough money to buy a Ferrari from that stuff. Like, is that something that the community would resent? I don't think so. It's it. it I mean, so again, there may be some people who feel like, oh, that guy. You know, um, a thing that amused me was that when Romero went to events, gaming events, there would be gamers who would go up to him and they would fall to their knees and they would be like, we're not worthy, which I think is actually a reference to Wayne's World, the movie, right? So it's like this this gaming culture thing, right? So they are kind of um, framing him as a, as a king or a god or whatever. And I think at some point people called him god. And it's kind of a, you know, it's, it's, it's a tongue-in-cheek thing. It's not entirely serious, but... And I, I remember being inter- interested and amused by that. Like these guys who were living off of pizza and diet coke and spending their whole months of their lives, years of their lives, kind of in in the basement. I mean, not literally in the basement, but like you know, in their offices or wherever, just hammering away at code to make a game. And then they become like these celebrities in in their scene. It's just an interesting thing to to observe and understand. And I have a lot to say about. You know, fanboys and fanboy culture, stan culture, right? The pedestalizing of humans as, you know, kind of uh, semi-godlike figures. I don't think that's healthy, but, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's a thing that happens and it's worth, it's, to me, it's something interesting to study. But that's not really what I want to focus on. I think what I, I, I already said what I think is the most exciting and interesting and compelling thing about this book and this idea and, and this story, right? This thing that happened. It's a thing that happened that a couple of geeks, nerds came together, made some stuff, shared it with people and people loved it and it changed the world. It did change the world in, you know, it became a, an industry. It became something that people can make a living in. And, you know, I'm sure that I haven't been like directly immersed in modern gamer culture and 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 daily news and and controversies and stuff like that but it's cool it's cool to me that they they helped to create this whole new media right I think another thing I I think a video I'm going to make after this is I'm going to talk about The Last of Us 2 the video game which is you know it's a video game but it's art in my opinion and these guys have contributed to making art possible, making a kind of art possible. And, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Even if, you know, I don't directly pay them, right? Like, uh, it's just cool. It's cool that you can live in a world where other people's accomplishments can benefit you indirectly, even if you're not 
paying for it if you're not buying it you know so I've, I've bought Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal uh, does any of that money go into Romero or Comics hands I mean do they care like does the money even matter right I mean everybody needs to make money to pay the bills to survive but beyond that like what is it that counts what is it that matters I think it's we all have a limited amount of time on this earth right we all have a limited amount of attention and we have the opportunity to tell to decide for ourselves what we think is important and interesting and then we can share that with other people and we can build relationships that way we can feel a sense of belonging that way and I think that's beautiful you know I, like uh, when Romero first started out being a video game nerd like his stepdad would would um, I think even beat him I'm not uh, yeah I think so uh, you know whatever it is, he disapproved right and he you know insulted him whatever and Romero went on to become successful at it. and I think his stepdad actually had a conversation with him many years later saying hey I'm, I'm man enough to admit that I was wrong about that Right, which is cool, right? It's cool that that can happen. I'm sure it doesn't always happen, but um, yeah. Anyway, so if you've played Doom or any first-person shooter from the '90s or early 2000s, or if you make stuff, right, I highly recommend reading this. I think there's a there's a lot to to appreciate about the creative journey, about what it's like to make stuff with other people, what it's like to put the stuff that you make out into the world and, 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 you know, have different people have different responses to it. What's kind of the emotional pressures and challenges that you face along the way. Lots of cool stuff. Done.